Uh, welcome everyone for the people on call and the people in our Zoom meeting today. Uh, we are having our second week of our 2020 RRIPG Summer Lecture Series. Uh, today we're going to start with Ms. Erica Marcano, followed by our Journal Club. So Ms. Erica Marcano, she's a Clinical Strategic Manager for Flex uh, New York Physical Therapy and Advanced Recovery. She's been on our team for quite a, some time now, and today she'll be presenting FIFA 11 Plus can success in soccer lead to risk reduction in rugby? So with Erica, would you be able to share your screen? Yeah, sure. Let me, okay. Hold on one sec. Let me pull this presentation up. Let's see. So it's asking me to leave the meeting so that you'll be able to record it. Do you know anything about that? I'll cancel it for now, but do you know why it might be doing that? Uh, so it is recording the meeting. Let's see. It's basically saying that like, unless, I don't know, it's telling me that like, I, if I share my screen that you would have to stop recording. So I don't want to mess up your. Okay. I'll topic. pause the recording. And then from there, I'll read, I'll start the recording again, if that makes sense. Then we can get to your screen. Okay, right. let's see if that works. So I'll just start this then. Okay, great. So hopefully I turned off every, I'm not used to screen sharing. I'm used to just being on video. So if any weird notifications or anything pops up, I'm sorry, I tried to put everything on do not disturb, but we'll just see how it goes. Um, so, this presentation it's basically about the FIFA 11 plus so depending on how involved you are with soccer you may or may not know what that is but we'll go through it um, and the question is can success in soccer lead to risk reduction in rugby so basically um, just kind of looking at a data review overall of what FIFA has done for injury prevention in terms of warm-up for their soccer players um, and then kind of seeing, do we have something that parallels that in rugby? And if not, could we use something like that? Um, whether it's using the FIFA 11 plus or designing something similar. So for those of you on the call or those of you listening in, I'm sure you can think back to a time maybe when you were an athlete, maybe you've coached a team, maybe you've interned or worked with the team and you can think about what the warm up looked like and you know, depending on what kind of team you're on, it may have looked really different. It may be a coach leading it. It might have been team captains leading it. Maybe athletes were expected to have warmed up on their own, or it was kind of just this, like, you get to the field or to the gym and everyone kind of does their own thing. There's a lot of that, like, sitting around in a circle, stretching, but really, like, gossiping and hanging out with each other um, doesn't accomplish too much. So warm-ups kind of look really different all across the board. So if you guys can just kind of all call to mind what a warm up might have looked like for you in the past. And then we are going to look at, um, if you were to Google rugby warm up, um, there's a couple of different things that come up. So first off, you have like YouTube videos that'll come up. And if you were to click into those videos, you notice that they're varying lengths. Some of them are like 15 minutes long. Some of them are four minutes long. And they also really vary in what skills they're trying to show you you should include in a warm up. So whether it's youth rugby all the way up to adult, you'll see a real hodgepodge of things that they're giving you as warm up skills. Um, rugby Ready, which is a site put out by World Rugby, they advocate for 10 to 20 minutes and they've broken it down into a three part series. So part one would be general mobility, part two is technical mobility, and then part three is skill prep or technical work, right? So general mobility um, might be some like stretching that's not really too dynamic. You're just getting warm. Technical mobility, now you're moving with the stretches. So you might be doing like walking lunges with a twist. And then skill prep or technical work, it's meant to mimic the skills they actually would be using in rugby. Um, you might also run into some articles by Rugby Coach Weekly. Now they have a whole video library of rugby specific warm up skills. The problem is each video pertains to a particular skill. And so you can go through this library, similar how you'd go to a library of your videos on YouTube. 
but there's nothing really explaining to you how to structure the warm up, which skills should come before other skills, what the right amount of time is for a warm up or anything like that. Um, there's another site called Ruck Science that comes up pretty frequently in internet searches. And what they advocate for is a program called Ramp. Now what they're doing is they're actually marketing their own programs to rugby players and they have everything from skill based to you know, things like nutrition, supplementation, but um, they advocate for six to 10 minutes of a ramp style warm up. And what that means is range of motion, activation, movement preparation, and then potentiation. And again, if um, you think about that skill prep or technical work um, on the rugby ready site, potentiation is very similar. It means you're priming the body for the skills that it's about to do. So if you are a rugby player, maybe you're coming back from injury, you've heard or your PT said to you, you know, you need to do a better warm up. This is the kind of information you would run into. If you were coaching a rugby program, um, similar to what I just asked you guys to think of, you know, you probably are basing it on your own experience in the past, and then maybe you're going to look into some research or look at what some other programs are doing. And again, this is the kind of information you're gonna run into. Now, the same could be said for what was going on in soccer a few years back they realized that there is a need for not only better warm-up programming, but a better like standardized warm-up programming. And the way that they realized that was over an injury study done by WEFA over seven consecutive seasons. And you can see there, they found an injury incidence of eight injuries per thousand hours. It was higher during matches than during training. And on average, a player had sustained two injuries per season. So a team with about 25 players was expecting 50 injuries each season. So in 1994, FIFA decided to establish FMARC. So this was their medical assessment and research center. And in 2000, they conducted their first study on not just injury incidents, but injury prevention um, in football injuries. So football being soccer, right? And they showed that when they provided an intervention, um, for injury prevention, which was the beginning of this standardized warm-up programming, they found a 21% injury rate decrease in that intervention group. So after they developed that and found those results in the study, then in 2006, they came up with the 11 plus. So the FIFA 11 was their basic program that they used in that study. They designed the 11 plus based on the FIFA 11, but also looking at the research of other injury prevention programs throughout other sports. So what is the FIFA 11 plus? So if you think back to that slide I showed you a few minutes ago about what was included in these rugby warmups, the FIFA 11 plus is a lot more in depth. So it still has three parts, but part one is gonna be running exercises. They're conducted at a slow speed. So they're running drills. Um, there's active stretching, sometimes you call it dynamic stretching, and there's controlled partner contacts. Part two is six very specific sets of exercises, and they focus on core strength, leg strength, balance, plyometrics, and agility. And then you've got three increasing levels of difficulty. So the warmer they get, the harder the exercises become. And then part three, we go back to those running drills, but now they're conducted at a moderate to high speed based on the athlete's level. And then you start combining them with planting and cutting movements, because those are some of the most common injury um, dynamics that happen in soccer. So we're really paying attention to these, to the posture, the alignment, and the form of the athletes. And it takes about 20 minutes to complete, and it's designed to completely replace whatever the traditional warm-up that the coaches or the athletes were doing beforehand. So you're not adding it onto your warm-up, um, you're not you know, taking pieces out of it and replacing it with yours, it's meant to come like out of the box onto your field. So in these running exercises, what they did, um, they set up these six pairs of parallel cones, five to six meters apart. So you can see them set up on the field over here. Each run was performed twice. So as you notice, they're going up in difficulty already, even in part one. So first you're just running straight ahead and then you're running back. Second one is hip circles. So you're going hip out and then hip in. Um, then you're going to a circling partner drill. You're doing some jumping with shoulder contacts. So when I talked about partner contacts before, um, just jumping straight up and making light contact with your partner. And then you have forward sprints and then backpedaling. 
know, part two, strength, plyometrics, and balance. So this is where they're getting really, really specific. Um, the first exercise that they're going to do is they're going to have the athletes plank on their elbows. So we know we're getting quad activation, glute activation, and core activation. They're holding for 20 to 30 seconds, and they're doing it three times. Um, after that, they're going, they, so they call their planks benches, right? The bench. So this is the bench alternating legs. So again, you're planking on your elbows and you're doing alternating straight leg hip extension. And this is going 40 to 60 seconds for three rounds. So basically you're, you're in this three point plank. You've got both forearms down, one leg, super, super strong. And then you're lifting the other leg up in the air, right? So now your obliques are working as well. Then you've got this bench, one leg, lift and hold. And this is just a single leg plank on the elbows, right? So rather than lifting one leg, putting it back down and going to the other leg and alternating, now you're just doing the sustained isometric hold for the 20 to 30 seconds. Then sideways bench static, that's a basic side plank. It's just gonna be on your elbow instead of with a long arm. Again, 20, 30 seconds, three rounds. And then uh, you're moving into a side plank where you're raising and lowering your hip. So um, like there's a lot of different names for these, right? I call them like hip dips, but you're in your side plank, nice and strong. And then you're slow and controlled, tapping the hip down to the ground and lifting it back up again. So lots of obliques, lots of glute made here. And then um, your next one is another side plank and it's a side plank with a leg lift. So now the bottom leg, the hip that's closer to the ground is staying super strong while you're lifting that other leg out into the air in an abduction movement. So that's their part two. Then we keep going, right? We went into these kind of core exercises. Now we're gonna move on to hamstrings. So Nordic hamstrings, it's been shown to be one of the best exercises for hamstrings that there is, whether you're recovering from injury, whether you're just doing strength training, anywhere from three to 15 reps based on the level of the athlete, because these are really challenging. Um, and you do these with a partner. Then you're gonna do a single leg balance, um, holding the ball, single leg balance, throwing the ball, uh, playing catch with your partner, single leg balance, test your partner. Basically what that means is one athlete is standing on one leg and the partner is kind of coming over and tapping them and they're having to balance as well as they can without tapping that other foot down to the floor. And we've got some squats with toe raises. Um, so we call these triple extension movements. So you're going into your squat you are flexed at the hips, flexed at the knees, flexed at the ankles, feet are in a great position. And then as you come up, you slowly move into full extension and you're balancing on your toes. We've got walking lunges, single leg squats, vertical and lateral jumps, and then finally box jumps. And these are not box jumps like what you would think at a gym where you're jumping up onto a platform. You're simply like in a box um, and they're jumping forward and backward, side to side, and then on diagonals within the box. And now we get to part three. So these are your running exercises. And we saw a little bit of running in the warm up, but now you're gonna see these really ramp up. They're gonna run across the full pitch, 40 meters um, at up to 80% of maximal effort. And then they jog the rest of the way. And then they're gonna jog back to the start. So lots of recovery when you think about um, when you think about their work to rest ratio here, they are getting lots of recovery, but that sprint is getting close to an all out. Um, they're doing bounding, so a couple warm up steps and then some bounding steps. Those are really plyometric. And then again, they're jogging the rest of the way, so they're getting some rest. Um, and then finally, plant and cut. Uh, we all know that's a mechanism for an ACL injury. So trying to get them really accommodated to the movements. Now we've got everything warm. We have their balance um, as good as it's gonna be for that session. And so now we're working with that plant and cut, quick movements, um, testing out their balance and their strength and their ability to pivot. So that is the FIFA 11 plus. So as the warm up, what it was shown to do in research was it, it did increase their resting oxygen uptake, it increased their core temperature and it increased lactate production, right? So it was definitely serving for all the things that they wanted a warm up to do. Now, as an injury prevention program, um, they really looked at this in depth because that was one of their biggest goals when they were designing this and doing the research. So they saw a significant reduction of injuries in female soccer players aged 13 to 18 in large RCTs when the program was performed at least twice a week. So these girls weren't even doing it every single day. We don't know how many days a week they were practicing, but it was up to 50% depending on the team. 
they saw a significant reduction in incidence of injuries, approximately 40% in Nigerian male players aged 14 to 19, and 46% in American male NCAA Division I and II players aged 18 to 25. Again, looking at the program being performed two to three times a week. Uh, literature review showed, including six studies, showed overall reduction of injuries anywhere between 33 and 57 percent. Um, so these are big differences here, but we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, and then a lit search, including 12 studies, showed overall injury reduction rate of 35 percent when performed at least 1.5 times a week. So compliance was key with all of these studies. Some additional performance benefits that they looked at, um, they had improved time to stabilization. Makes sense when you're thinking about the balance work that they were doing, especially on um, those partner drills, right? They did it even from the very beginning of the warm up. those contact drills with the shoulders. They saw improved core stability, um, improved concentric and eccentric flexor strength, improved conventional strength ratio, fast slow speed ratio, proprioception, static balance and dynamic balance, right? So basically a ton of positive results aside from the injury reduction. So then of course, people wanted to see, could it transition to other sports? So the FIFA 11 plus when used in male basketball players has been proven effective in reducing their injury risk. Um, there was an injury surveillance program that was performed throughout nine months of a basketball season, 11 teams from the same club and they were split into controls and interventions. Um, and they saw a significant difference in the intervention group for overall injuries, training injuries, lower extremity, acute and severe injuries. Um, but interestingly enough, knee and ankle injuries, they didn't see a significant difference, um, no significance in match injuries and no significance in overuse injuries. So there are some other popular programs that are out there. I don't know um, if you guys have heard of any of these, but I did want to list them and give them credit. Um, but any of these other programs you see on the screen, a lit review showed that overall risk reduction of 42, um, I'm sorry, 52% in female athletes and of 85% in the male athletes that perform these consistently, right? So again, just compliance and consistency is key if you're doing something over time that's building, you know, range of motion, mobility, strength, um, and is related to the sport that you're playing, um, at least in some ways, if not all, it was showing risk reduction. So some concerns that we have out there, um, and this is, I think, a big concern in sports across the board, but especially um, young athletes, ACL prevention programs, um, a lot of times you'll see them marketed as that, and you know, a lot of times you'll see like injury prevention programming, so they are effective in reducing the risk of injury in athletes, but the ideal composition of the programs has not really been determined, right? So any of the factors we talked about um, might include balance training, static stretching, how fatigued the athlete is, what adaptations are they making based on their skill level, male versus female, and then adaptations based on age, right? So all of those factors are included. So we just want to be careful when we're talking about, um, you know, whether it's talking to a coach, talking to a parent, talking to an athlete. Um, injury prevention really got thrown around a lot, I would say, in the last decade or so, because obviously everybody's looking to prevent injury, further their athletic career. So we have seen overall improvements when we're using these really effective and efficient warm-up programs. But we just want to be careful about, you know, what we call them and how we market them to people. So now some challenges with implementing this, right? So we have all the data that backs it up and we're like, hey, this looks like a good idea. You know, 20 minute warm up um, should not be a big deal, right? And as you guys know, I'm an athletic trainer. Um, I've worked with college athletes. I've worked with youth athletes. So if I was to come in and say I wanted to implement a program like this, depending on you know, the team I was coming into or the league I was coming into, these are some challenges you might be met with. Um, marketing is a big one. Um, just trying to make sure that everybody's on board with what you're doing, right? Because if everyone doesn't buy in, we're gonna have a problem with it from the beginning. So making sure, like I said, like that you sell it appropriately. Um, the amount of time that it takes up. So 
you saw early on when we looked at those rugby slides, some people are advocating for a six minute warm up. Um, if you guys, you know, in the midst of quarantine, maybe have been doing like workouts at home, maybe you've been doing like the Peloton app or another app, right? You'll see the warm ups are usually four to five minutes and then you might do an hour of work. So the time commitment of 20 minutes, uh, sometimes coaches don't really want to dedicate that much time to a warm up. Um, athlete supervision to make sure that their form is correct is another one. Uh, like I said, I, I worked at a division one school and the team captains were often expected to run the warm ups. So if they're running them, they're also doing them. So nobody's really watching the form of the athletes and maybe the captains are doing it right, but are the freshmen doing it right is the question. Um, do you have consistent team and player adherence? Um, so universal neuromuscular training of all the athletes showed better outcomes than screening and only providing neuromuscular training to high risk athletes, right? So you want to have the whole team doing this, not just people who are coming back from an injury or people that maybe your team doctor identified as at risk, right? We don't want to put them separate from the rest of the team. We want everybody doing this together. Um, and then just the staff education of the people who are supervising it. So the highest rates of effectiveness were found when a coach, um, you know, a physio, so that could be an athletic trainer, physical therapist that works with the team, or even maybe not the sport coach, but the strength and conditioning coach were supervising this. Um, that was found to be the most successful. So I found this really interesting. Um, I wanted to share it with you guys. In a study that evaluated beliefs of coaches, players, physios, and fitness coaches, so strength and conditioning coaches, across four professional soccer teams from different countries, everyone agreed soccer players were at a high risk of lower extremity injuries. Everyone thought players should be performing evidence-based injury prevention exercises, right? So we all agreed on that. 85% of people believe that lower extremity injuries can shorten a player's career. 82% believe that they could cause physical problems later in life. 77% believe that injuries negatively affect a team's performance, right? So it's clear that all these professionals, all these coaches, um, coaches, players, and the sports medicine staff were on the same page when it came to the effect of, the, well, the way injuries can affect a player's career, right? And what their risk was. But once they got around to questioning them about whose responsibility injury prevention was, it was all over the board. Nobody could agree on which specific exercises were effective for injury prevention. Um, nobody could decide when injury prevention programming could be performed, right? Was it something the athletes should be doing on their own? Should they do it on, in warm up on the field? Should they only do it before practice, but not before a game? Uh, should the strength and conditioning programming have it? Should they be doing it in the athletic training room? Um, now, keep in mind, they were studying soccer teams and nobody was really too sure uh, about what exactly the FIFA 11 plus was. They knew what it was intended for, but they wouldn't be able to run you through the exercises the way we just did. And then 47% of them basically said like, yeah, the 11 plus is great, but like for my team, I would change some things, right? So in the last slide, they were all agreeing, hey, we want this evidence-based programming. But when I got around to actually doing it, they were already very quick to want to make changes to it. Um, and nobody could really agree on whose job it was to actually do it. So the question is, is there a potential for us to use this in rugby? So obviously, there's continued research needed. Um, you know, you guys are all working with rugby at this point. Um, so you know the differences between rugby, soccer, and even basketball, um, like we mentioned in the study. Um, again, injury prevention programs, we want to be really careful uh, for using that terminology. We also have to think about non-contact versus contact injuries. Um, in soccer and rugby, those two look really, really different. Uh, we also want to be cautious about the term sport specific as opposed to movement specific, right? Because there are some things that are very native and unique to certain sports, but then when we start to break down, okay, what movements do these athletes need to be able to perform? Sometimes we find more commonalities than would really meet the eye at first. We need to look at the level of skill versus athleticism, um, and this can vary sport to sport, and it can also vary like position to position within a sport. Um, so just thinking about, you know, the pillars of athleticism, strength, power, or agility, speed, and mobility. Um, 
you know, good athlete is going to have all of those and our rugby players really need all of those. So we want to make sure that we're going to use a warm up that includes all of those pillars so that we have the highest performance and the lowest injury risk. And that is it for me, but I would love to hear questions from you guys if you have any, or um, we can talk about this a little bit more uh, in terms of rugby, in terms of coaches you know, or athletes you know, um, or anything like that. I'm happy to chat about it. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Erica. That was actually a really interesting presentation. Um, does anyone here have any questions right now? Give it a moment. Yeah. Megan? Um, so I actually play in college, like college soccer, um, mm -hmm. and I was wondering how I could bring that program to a team that's like, we get, like, we have quite a few athletes get injured and our warm up is like five minutes, um, like you said. It's like nothing really crazy. And I don't know how to get them to like buy into something as lengthy as the FIFA 11 is. So how do you think I could do that? So who's in charge of your warm up, Megan? Is it like the coaches or your captains? Um, the captains run it, but it's been like the same thing for years. I'm pretty sure it's just been implemented by the coach and the mm -hmm. captains just run it every year. So, um, and do you guys have like a strength and conditioning coach and an athletic trainer? Yeah. Okay. So I always think like, so I'm an athletic trainer and a strength and conditioning coach, but, um, in the college, my role was just as an athletic trainer and, I think athletic trainers are really uniquely suited to advocate for the athletes, right? Because they're in this position that's kind of like in between. And so I think when it comes to like anything that's to do with injury prevention, um, the athletic trainer is probably a really good person to go through. And so if you brought this up to your ATC or your strength and conditioning coach and you're like, Hey, you know, I attended this like presentation on this the other day and it sounded like so smart and there's so much evidence on it. Do you think that's something that coach would do? Um, and then, you know, I feel like a lot of times the coaches and the rest of the staff are on this peer level where they could have those conversations where when an athlete brings it up, um, depending on the coach, you might have a really good relationship with your coach, but sometimes it's kind of like, you know, that's not your place to bring that. The other way you can do it is, I feel like anytime one athlete has success with something, other athletes want to emulate it, right? Um, we see that all the time. And I have like, I had one athlete, for example, I worked with baseball and one pitcher was struggling and it happened to be like his yearly eye appointment and he got new contacts and suddenly he was like striking people out left and right. And the next week I had eight guys want to go to the eye doctor because they were like, maybe I'll throw better if like I have contacts. And I'm like, do any of you actually like need contacts? Right. But they all had to go. Um, so if you were to implement this like over the summer and then come back and be like, wow, I feel like I'm able to pivot so much quicker or like I didn't get knocked off balance at all um, during X drill that people really struggle with, then people are going to kind of be like, well, what are you doing? And I, that's another kind of like little insidious way to implement it. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, with that, any other questions? I have a question. Hi, Erica. Hi, Erica. Um, so uh, basically, what are like types of recommendations you would say to help motivate athletes to actually take the time and do these, um, you know, these pre warm up things to uh, avoid injury? Um, I think talking honestly to any athlete who's like been injured can be one of the biggest motivators because I, and you hate to like, you don't want to use fear as a motivator, but you also have athletes who kind of look back and say like, I wish I had something like this when I was training because maybe I would have had different outcomes. Um, and you see athletes like that, even after their surgery, like let's say we get a new technique or a new modality or um, you know, there's an upgrade to the facility and athletes who are seniors will kind of say to the freshmen, like, wow, like you don't know what you have here, but I wish somebody had brought that to me. Um, so once you get a few athletes on your side who are advocating for it, um, who are saying like, you don't know what you're missing if you're not doing this, I think that's the quickest way to get buy-in. So 
even if nobody at your school that you're working with or that you're training with has ever done this, um, you can go and talk to people who have implemented it and they're going to tell you the same thing that the research is telling you. Um, you know, that, yeah, they did see an injury reduction rate when they did this that season and they probably wish they would have done it sooner. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I mean, we implemented, when I was working with college soccer, like we implemented all kinds of things and some of them were like at my discretion and some of them the coaches brought to me. I mean, we had seen, it was like a very hot summer and we had heard of other schools who started before us having issues with like heat related illnesses. And so me and the coaches got together and they were basically like, we want to start a hydration program. And so I was like, all right, let me like think on it and figure things out. And we actually did something which um, I was working with the men's team at the time. I probably wouldn't have done this with the women's team, but I got these like sheets from Gatorade and they were like weigh in sheets. And so my guys came to my office in the athletic training room every single day. And we were doing two days or three days. And before every session, they wrote in their, they weighed in, wrote in their weight. And then after every session, they weighed in and wrote in their weight. And I was able to look at them after every practice and see like, who may have lost too much water weight and monitor their, their hydration status like that. In addition to like, you know, looking at the color of their urine and all that type of stuff that you tell athletes to do and then you have to hope that they do it. We had like numerical data right there where I could come to the coaches and be like, you know, six of your guys struggled after this practice and lost too much weight. And we were able to immediately give feedback um, and, implement a change and when people see that the athletes are feeling better performing better um you know people will be happy to implement it even if it's you know annoying or it takes extra time right like writing in your weight six times a day sounds crazy but everyone loved it Well, thank you with that erica um with that if anyone has any questions on that that was that thank was you, a, i really like that can you hear me some? Yeah. Okay, yeah. No, uh, I think um, Erica has uh, hit it right on the uh, nail. Uh, the issue is trying to, um, give me a sec. Or implement an injury prevention program is very, very hard. I think they've written papers on the success of I think he's back. Dr. Lopez, can you hear us? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah we can. Uh, I guess I was saying too much. I'll try to be brief. Um, the importance here is, uh, I guess, compliance comes with culture. And I think um, Erica can, can comment on this with me. Um, it's hard to implement something um, when the different entities don't want to work together as a team. And I think uh, when we talk about a team, we're talking about all the facets that make up sports medicine or um, injury prevention, uh, whether you're the coach, strength and conditioning, nutrition, um, you know, ca team captain, um, uh, assistant coach, or whatever, even sports psychologists. The aspect is, is that all of those have to be on the same page so that this way they have the same outcome. But uh, again, it's very, very hard to discuss this um, ideal situation or implement it. And we had problems with, you know, uh, being, in, you know, included in the Olympic development teams. They, they had a certain way of doing things and we couldn't really propose major changes with the, the amount of dynamics that were going on with the teams. Players were rotating in and out. Uh, staffing was rotating in and out. And I think um, uh, the best example of that in the professional aspect is um, I think Dr. Allen went through five head coaches in the next about five years ago. Over a three-year period, four-year period, there was about five or six different coaches. So just imagine 
the same problems we're encountering at the amateur to, uh, to um, sub elite level even occurs at the professional level where there's a, uh, uh, um, um, a misstep or a lack of continu continu excuse me, continuity amongst the team. And that's really, really hard to keep driven. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just something that I think uh, compliance is always the biggest problem. And I think they've measured it, even some of the studies, they measured on, well, how many, if you have a 50% compliance rate on your team, you know, uh, obviously there's some serious miscommunication somewhere. And I think that percentage, I'm going to quote from a paper, but I'm not going to say what sport or what paper. But the importance is, if you're encountering a 50% compliance, what happened with the, I mean, that's a lot of players. You're missing, you're missing half the team that is, that is not complying with an injury prevention plan that supposedly is coming from the top down and you have science that backs it for its success rate. Anyway, uh, in a nutshell, I think it's very hard to uh, employ that compliance aspect. And let alone whether you go into youth and you think that you're going to have less compliance there, or you go into sub-elite or, you know, ego players um, in professional. It's, it's just a problem that's very, very hard to root out. If you're, and, and it has nothing to do with the trying to even get the players to understand what the impact of it is. It's just you need that compliance from multiple facets before even launching trying to get this. Uh, but Megan, um, if you want, they offer the FIFA Plus for free in a PDF. So I can send that to you in a book format. And or Erica, you can send it to her if you like. Um, and this way you can employ, try to employ, you can send it to all your team members. Be the point of the spear. Be, be the tip of the spear and make it happen. Yeah, and I mean, the quickest way to get buy-in, and this is for anybody and across the board, right? Not just when it comes to like doing a warm up, but like sometimes you, like obviously the ideal is that you're respected by a big enough group of people that they're going to believe that you're working in their best interest and they're going to do what you ask them to do, right? But a lot of times when we work with teams, we don't have the time to get that buy-in and that respect yet, right? Sometimes we're meeting a team, it's preseason, and we have to implement something immediately. And the quickest way to get buy-in and compliance from everybody is to get buy-in from somebody who's really well-respected. Um, so it might be a coach, but it might be certain players on the team. And so you might have to spend a little bit of extra time kind of going through it with those people because like, I mean, think of yourselves as kids, like whatever sport you liked as a kid and whatever your idol was, you probably were mimicking what they were doing, right? Like me and my brother grew up in like the Michael Jordan era. My brother shot all his shots with his tongue out of his mouth. Why? I, I mean, did it help my brother? No, but Michael Jordan did it. And kids around the world were emulating Michael Jordan. And there's a whole generation of kids who grew up shooting basketballs like that. Um, I'm sure you can think about a memory from when you were a kid. It might not have been an athlete. Maybe it was, you know, a parent or an uncle that you wanted to do something just like them. And we learn by like mimicking, right? So somebody very respected amongst a group of athletes is buying in and is doing this. You're going to get a lot more buy-in from everybody else. And that's probably the quickest way to get it implemented. Well, thank you. That was still really, that was a really good perspective on compliance. 